Welcome to the Jewish Theological Seminary. I'm Rabbi Bert Vysotsky. I am the Lustein Director of the Louis Finkelstein Institute for Religious and Social Studies. And we are very happy to be co-sponsoring tonight's panel with three other institutions. Um, I'll, I'll wave at David Rosen. I'm not going to introduce him in a moment. But he is the director, CEO. What would you like to be? I would probably be the executive director. The executive director of the Hebrew Free Loan Society, and they are our partners. And the Reverend Chloe Breyer, Chloe, give a wave, um, who is the, what do you want to be? The executive director? It's good enough for David. Uh, the executive director of the Interfaith Center of New York. And um, I, I'm not sure our third partner has a representative here. The um, JCC of Harlem, the Jewish Community Center of Harlem, who was very kind to, oh, Ruth will be our, a representative. Uh, Ruth Messenger, who is also the Louis Finkelstein Fellow for Social Justice here at JTS. Some of you know her as the immediate past president of the American Jewish World Service, but some of you also remember her fondly as the borough president of Manhattan. So uh, we're, we're very glad that Ruth is here as well. Tonight's panel is on breaking the bank, the high cost of low income living. We are particularly interested and honored to have members of the clergy and the community here tonight. We have representatives from the Muslim community, representatives from the Christian community, and representatives from the Jewish community. And I would invite you to join those clergy and those leaders along with everyone else in one of the great interreligious customs that has now become common here in New York City. Please turn off your cell phones. You can leave yours on. Um, it, it is not accidental that we are meeting here and having this panel between Thanksgiving and the holiday season of Hanukkah and then Christmas because we know that our neighbors and our friends often find themselves, sometimes unwillingly, deep in debt, bringing joy to their family. And that's not how it should be. And so tonight we're going to examine some of the institutions that power the finance in New York, and particularly for low-income families. Tonight's moderator, immediately to my left, there's no political comment there that I know of yet, um, is Ron Lieber, the Your Money columnist for the New York Times. Uh, Ron is also the author of The Opposite of Spoiled, A Guide to Teaching Kids About Money and Values. For those of us who read his column, you already know that it's about anything and everything that hits you in the wallet, from investing to paying for college to mortgages and homes. Before Ron started writing for the Times, he helped develop a personal finance website called FiLife and wrote for the Wall Street Journal, Fast Company, and Fortune. He's author and co-author of three books, including the New York Times bestseller, Taking Time Off which encouraged young adults to take a year off between high school and college or sometime during their undergraduate years. Um, I'm hoping that that also applies to people my age. Good. On my far left is Carmen De La Rosa. Carmen is a career public servant and resident of northern Manhattan. Born in the Dominican Republic, she immigrated to New York City as a young child and is proud to be the first person in her immediate family to graduate from college. She has a degree in political science and certification in peace and justice studies from Fordham University. In 2007, she began her career working for New York State Assemblymember Daniel O'Donnell. A lifelong resident of Inwood, she resides on the same street on which she was raised. So let's hear it for Inwood. Um, I want to say proudly that um, many of our current rabbinical students now live in Inwood. They're, they're, they're your neighbors. Um, in November 2016, Carmen was elected to the New York State Assembly for the second, 72nd Assembly District. We're in the 72nd Assembly District as we speak. And she is a member, and this is important, of the Assembly's Committee on Banks. Uh, Lisa Servan is Professor of City Planning at the University of Pennsylvania and a former Dean at the New School, my sympathy. She is the author of a number of books, including Bridging the Digital Divide, Technology, Community, and Public Policy, Bootstrap Capital, Microenterprises and the American Poor, Gender and Planning, a Reader, 
I'm going to try this and forgive me, Spanish is not my language. Otra vida es posible. Es posible? Posible. Thank you. Practices en económicos alternativos. This could be English. Alternativas durante la crisis. Um, uh, other life is possible. I'm going to take a stab at this. Between two Spanish speakers here, we're, we're going to be able to do it. Um, practical econ economic alternatives during the crisis? Yes. Another life is possible. Thank you. Um, and her research is not only featured in the forthcoming documentary, Spent Looking for Change, but her most recent book, opposite to tonight's topic, is The Unbanking of America, How the New Middle Class Survives. Last but not least, my student, my colleague, my friend, Rabbi David Rosen, became executive director of the Hebrew Free Loan Society in September 2015. Previously, he was executive vice president of the New Israel Fund, and before that, he was the founder and director of Avodah, the Jewish Service Corps. David served as a chaplain for Momentum AIDS Project in New York. I'm still grateful to you, David, for taking my bar mitzvah aged son and giving him a meaningful project, which he worked at for five years. And David was also a hospital chaplain at Beth Israel Medical Center. He graduated from Harvard University, and holds a master's in Hebrew letters from the Jewish Theological Seminary, that would be right here, where he was ordained in 1997. Ron, it's up to you. Thank you, Rabbi. <laughs> um, thanks so much for being here tonight. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here um, with this particular group of uh, rock stars. Um, and I. I've gotten to know them a little bit on sort of the pre-calls and reading up on them, but I want to help you get to know them personally, too. So we're just going to start with um, a personal question before we start, start talking about their professional interests. And um, I was hoping all three of you could start with the following. Could you please tell us the most salient memory of money from your childhood um, and the biggest financial lesson that you've learned over time personally? Assemblywoman. Thank you. So I think the most salient memory of money was when I was entering college and I applied to be a HEOP student, um, Higher Education Opportunity Program. Uh, it was a program for sort of low income New Yorkers who were looking to get into college um, and needed that opportunity sort of to, to go through with the college um, application process. So up until that point, I didn't realize I was poor. Um, I grew up in a household where my mother was a home attendant. She made, at the height of her career, $11 an hour. And my father retired really early when I was in about fifth grade because he had illness. So, but I never wanted for anything. I, I recall having a childhood where um, you know, Christmases were great and, and I never realized. You know, here I am applying for HEOP and I'm like, why do I need this again? Um, and I quickly learned that we had saved no money for college and that if I wanted to go to college, I would have to make do with scholarship money, with student loans, with applying for HEOP and other opportunity programs in order to actually get into college. And so I remember sort of thinking back at that moment and understanding that although I grew up in a neighborhood where it's a disadvantaged neighborhood, and I went to parochial school, so I was seen as someone who actually had means. Mm -hmm. I really didn't, and it was the effort sort of of my parents to make sort of um, an extraordinarily bad situation possible for me to even get to that point. So I remember um, one of the major lessons about money was what happens now that I'm in college? What happens the first time that I'm given a credit card? Um, and what do I do now that I'm a mother to make sure that I'm prepared for when my little girl has to go to college on this public servant mm -hmm. income that I have now? Um, and how to sort of manage and live within my means in order to get there. Yeah, I have a book for you about that. Um, I, you know, it was interesting to hear your story about, I guess, what was sort of an emerging social class consciousness or a consciousness of your own social class. I had a not dissimilar experience at college when I arrived for the very first weekend, 
And um, on the schedule that day was a, you know, a, a, a meeting for financial aid students. And I realized that it, you know, at that hour, or five minutes to that hour, all of the kids who were on scholarship were going to literally like walk down the hill and all sit together in an auditorium. And all of the kids who were full payers, whose families were full payers, were gonna stay back up at the dorm, you know, hanging out and kind of doing nothing. And I remember spending the hour before that um, particular meeting wondering who was gonna walk down the hill with me and who was gonna stay up at the dorm. Um, and there was a sort of a turning point for me uh, financially just in terms of thinking about who has what and how you try to read that, uh, you know, visually or verbally. Rabbi? My parents divorced when I was 10 years old and my mother at the time was an English teacher. And my father was an attorney. And uh, for us, it was a moment where my mother realized that she was gonna need to support herself and my brother and myself. My father was helping, of course, but she didn't really particularly, she wasn't prepared to do that on a teacher's salary. And so she, I think, in a brilliant move, said to my father, all right, I was teaching in the New York City public schools while you went to law school, so now you will um, help me go to law school. And she did go to law school. Uh, she graduated uh, high up in her class. She became a partner at a firm. We were living in, in Miami by that time. And um, I saw my mother make very conscious, very difficult financial decisions uh, because she knew that she had to contend with a reality that she wasn't expecting in her life. And uh, when I myself was ready to go to college, um, I was one of the kids who hung out in the dorm because my parents were both able to give me an incredible gift, wh which was they sent me to college and I es managed to get through my entire program without any debt. Mm -hmm. And so one of my lessons <laughs> that I learned was that uh, it is a huge gift to your children if you can help them go to college and emerge without any debt. And so my wife and I have tried very hard to do what we can to save up enough money so that our kids will have that opportunity. Right, and for those keeping score at home, that is uh, you know, roughly $100,000 or thereabout, unless you qualify for the new scholarship, uh, you know, to walk in the door at SUNY for four or five years and pay full room and board undiscounted. And for you know, a few dozen of the uh, most competitive colleges in the country, including Penn, if you, if you walk in today, you're looking at 300 grand per kid. Uh, if you don't get financial aid, so that's unless you teach there. <laughs> unless you teach there, in which case you get a discount, uh, which might or might not be taxed starting January first, depending on what. Um, but this is not a political event, exactly. Um, thank you, Rabbi Professor. <laughs> um, yeah, well, it's funny you hear other people's stories and you want to build on those, but I think my first, my kind of first memory, or maybe most salient memory about Monday money was growing up. I grew up in a small town in New Jersey. And uh, I went to the bank at different times with both my parents. So my dad would do kind of Saturday morning errand rituals. He'd go to the post office and get his hair cut and go to the local butcher and, and then go to the bank, Pulaski Savings and Loan. He was the only Polish family who had moved there. There were a lot of Polish families. And you know, it was a friendly place. I got a bank account when I was about seven. I had a passbook. Some of you are old enough to remember those. Mine was green with gold letters on it. And I learned, you know, I, I don't think I realized until much later that I was being trained to be a particular kind of financial consumer by just going to the bank. My mom was also, my, my parents were both teachers. My mom would go to the drive through on Fridays when she got her check and get an envelope full of cash. And so that, I think, was really important training. Um, and uh, I, I was also one of the kids who went down the hill in college. So, um, I, and I, my parents, uh, you know, my parents, were kind of in the middle. They, they felt like I should, I was smart. They felt like I should go to the pl best place I could go and not worry about how much it cost. Um, but they hadn't saved a whole lot. So they and I took out a lot of loans. Um, luckily, I was able to pay those back over time. And I learned also how to um, scratch and dig and find every cent I could for graduate school. So I did not mm -hmm. have to pay for my own graduate school. But it was good training. I have a lot of dirt under my nails from that still because mm -hmm. my, my family says I know how to like find money under a rock. So um, being, being resourceful about it as well. 
Excellent. Um, and we'll keep it with you here, because uh, I'm hoping to hear next, and that the rest of you will hear next, about the role that money and financial services plays in their sort of day-to-day -day professional lives, to the extent that it does. And I know it's not your full-time job, Assemblywoman, but you have a more than a passing interest in it. But um, Professor, let's start with you. Um, your uh, most recent book is one of the most sort of badass pieces of ethnography uh, I've, I've seen in a good long while. Will you um, tell us? Um, about um, how you literally went to work handling money and why you chose to do that and what you learned from the process. Yeah, thank you. Um, so thank you for the compliment uh, from one author to another. <laughs> it, Ron's book, um, The Opposite of Spoiled, is my Bible for my kids. If anyone thank has you. children or grandchildren, you should absolutely buy it and, and live by it and read it. Um, so I was teaching at the New School. I was teaching a course called Gender Development and Finance. I invited a woman who ran a credit union in the South Bronx named Joy Kuzminer to come and talk to my class because I wanted, she had started the credit union to serve low-income women. And she insisted on bringing a friend. She's now in her 90s. Um, until a few years ago, she was going to work six days a week. Uh, so when Joy asked for something, I didn't say, no, you can't bring your friend. It turned out, to make a long story short, her friend was a guy named Joe Coleman who uh, had a business running check cashing stores. He had a chain of 13 stores in the South Bronx in Harlem. And my students and I had read all of these pieces of literature and research about how check cashers were evil and predatory and ripping off the poor. And Joe came in and made a pretty compelling argument for why he thought his businesses were serving the community and why the banks were not doing a good job of serving them. And this was also around the time that the FDIC had started doing an every two year survey called the Survey of Unbanked and Underbanked Households. And they had found at that time, which I think is 2009, um, that there were about 20% of American households who had a bank account but also used what are called alternative financial services, pawn shops, check cashers, uh, et cetera, and another 8% who had no bank account at all. And the leap from those findings to policy was, wow, those people must not know what I know. They must be pretty ignorant if they're not using a bank. Um, and so let's get them all into bank accounts. And Joe's kind of said, the banks don't want them. Anyway, so that was really interesting to me. I had a lot of other research on my plate, but about, I started thinking about it. I looked at all the data. Um, I still couldn't really answer that question. I knew from my own research in low-income neighborhoods that the people who are poor know where every penny goes, and so it didn't make sense to me that they were willfully throwing away money on financial services. So to make a long story short, I called this guy Joe up about five years later and asked if he would hire me to be a teller in one of his shops. And so I worked in the South Bronx for about four months as a check casher teller. I then went to California and worked at a payday lender and, a l and as a loan collector. And the idea was to really try to get as close to the problem as possible so that I could really understand why people were doing what they were doing. Thanks. Rabbi? I have the privilege of serving as executive director at the Hebrew Free Loan Society, which is a 125-year-old uh, nonprofit loan fund. We make interest-free loans to New Yorkers in need, low and moderate income New Yorkers. Uh, everything from general needs loans to loans for college and graduate school, small business, housing. Uh, we have a program that provides the parents of kids with special education need, needs who are getting the tuition paid by the city, but the city only does it on a reimbursement basis. We do bridge loans so that they can afford to use that program. We will do this year about $14 million worth of lending, and uh, we are one of, I think, about 40 Hebrew free loans across the country, all of them independent. We're in a network. We talk to each other a lot but we're not uh, in organizationally connected. So the most salient thing that I do every day uh, in terms of uh, finances is um, I, together with my colleague Kim Kaplan, the deputy director at the Hebrew Free Loan Society, I get a chance to review the loan applications from people who are applying, and I get a real window into what it is that people need money for and, um, and why they're coming to us. Um, I, we can talk about this a little bit later, but um, there's a lot of uh, unmet health expenses that are going on uh, out there. There's a lot of people who are getting full tuition from Pell and Tap for their college tuition, but they still cannot afford the cost of attending college full time, and so they borrow some of the extra for us. 
and um, we have a 99.9% repayment rate. Uh, that is because the way that we secure our loans is not through collateral, but it's by asking uh, the borrowers to come with two people from their life who will uh, guarantee the loan. That is, they have to ask two people who they know to promise to pay the loan if they, th they can't pay it for some reason. And that puts a tremendous amount of um, pressure on them to, to pay the loan themselves. They don't want to leave their next door neighbor or their, uh, their in-laws uh, paying off the, the, the debt. And, and so the system really works. We're able to do these loans without charging any fees or interest. People out there in the communities are able to stand up for each other as, as guarantors and borrowers together. And that system works to, um, to make repayment happen. And we're, we then just recycle the money back out into the community again. And why did you want this job? Uh, you had a pretty good job before, and the whole yeah. like you know professional Jewish person money lender <laughs> thing <laughs> might have might give some people pause. Yeah, it <laughs> it it was the opposite for me because uh, I went into the rabbinate because I wanted to work uh, in and through the Jewish community to translate our values around. Uh, mutual responsibility and caring for each other into action. And um, there are many good organizations that do this. The Hebrew Free Loan Society is an incredible example of the community walking the walk. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this was started by immigrants on the Lower East Side in 1892 who were trying to help out other immigrants. And uh, the community for 125 years has insisted that lower income people ought to have the ability to access credit that is safe and affordable to them. And that makes me extremely proud of how we are living out our values. And so to me, it feels like a rabbinate of, of teaching by doing. And that feels uh, like a very uh, powerful way for me to, uh, to serve my calling. Teaching by doing. I like that. Um, Assemblywoman, when you decided to run for office, um, what percentage of your motivation had something to do with securing and preserving the financial stability and security of your neighbors? So in my community, just so to give a picture to everyone, First of all, this is the 69th district. I can't take credit for this beautiful building. Um, I represent the 72nd district, which is a little bit further up north. And sort of the profile for my community is that 50% of the residents in my district are foreign born, are immigrants. 20% live below the poverty line. Um, and 60% are considered rent burdened. Um, and of that, there's, there's also 13% that are unemployed. So it's much higher than the average in the entire city. Um, and so my relationship with money and sort of my motivations have a lot to do with poverty. And the relationship that my community has um, as a result of the impoverished circumstances in which my neighbors live. So for example, I'll give you one of the reasons that I ran for office was have, has a lot to do with the eviction and the gentrification that is happening in my community. So my district has the highest number of rent-stabilized apartment in the entire state of New, York, of New York. And a lot of my neighbors are people who have been living in my community for decades. They're now seeing themselves as the new face of displacement. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of harassment is happening from landlords. A lot of people are being sort of pushed out as the market forces take over and our communities are being developed. And so there was sort of a calling for people that knew intimately the issues of the community, that had lived the issues of the community, to come out and be a voice, to bring some fresh ideas and, and be able to be an advocate for those people. Um, in addition to that, on a daily basis in my office, I see people, for example, the other day I had a woman who came in. She's a paraprofessional at a school. So she was behind on her rent payments, and she was facing eviction. And I said to her, I said, why are you behind on your payments? She said, well, I only work through the school year. There's three months of the year that I'm out of work. And I fall behind every summer. And then I come back, I get a one-shot deal, I get back on my feet, I start work again, and I'm able to catch up. And I said to her, I said, 
well, if you know you only get paid nine months out of the 12 months, why not stretch out the money so that you can cover the gaps? And she said, well, I can't do that because if I, I don't have enough to stretch out, and if I try to stretch out the money, what ends up happening is that my cell phone will get cut off or my, I can't buy medication. And sort of that's the cycle that my community is in at the moment. It's a community that is aging, um, that people don't have access to just basic needs. Um, and sort of that motivation to be able to be an advocate for the community where I grew up, um, to sort of talk about the experiences that I've had. Um, in relation to high crime areas, in relation to uh, the, the relationship that I've had with money, with my neighbors, and, and to be able to be an advocate in Albany, where most of these laws are sort of changed, tweaked every single year. We see them fail on the floor. And so to be able to go up to Albany and advocate for my community was sort of the motivating force behind me running for office. And I think that the reason I was successful was because people really connected. Like when someone says to me, for example, well, you know there's um, illicit activities happening on the corner of 204th and whatever. I know where that is. And I was able to pinpoint to why that was happening on that corner and connect with my community in that way. So I think that my relationship with money, although I don't deal with finances every single day, as the other panelists do, it's more of a circumstance or a, a it's sort of um, reflective of the community's relationship with poverty and how that has an Im a daily impact on the lives of New Yorkers who are working hours and hours on end in order to just simply make ends meet. Okay, thank you. Um, professor, um, let's talk a little bit about the um, specific services that exist in many low-income communities that we may think that we know something or a lot of things about, um, but perhaps we don't, or perhaps we have the wrong idea. You know, I'm thinking in particular of, of check cashing institutions, what used to be called currency exchanges. Um, I, th I think many of us have sort of preconceived notions about uh, what they do and how they serve or ill serve um, the people they purport to be serving. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what your um, what you thought you knew uh, uh, about these institutions before you studied them and what you eventually learned by the time you were done? Sure, uh, yeah, so I think uh, I probably shared a lot of the thoughts and beliefs about these institutions that I would imagine a lot of you do before I went into it. Um, I, and pretty much everything I could get my hands on to read supported those, that they were taking advantage of low-income people, that they were predatory, um, that they were unscrupulous. There's a lot of things that go along with that, too. So the, the portrait that had been painted for me in policy and, and literature and in the media was, was pretty negative. Um, when Joe Coleman came to my class and spoke uh, pretty convincingly, and if you met him, you'd probably think he was a pretty a guy who exudes some integrity, um, it gave me pause and I realized that the conclusions that had been drawn by people whose work I had read didn't necessarily draw on the kind of research that it needed to, that there was a leap between the data and the assumptions. Um, when I actually, after I started working in the places that I worked in, and in addition to working behind the teller counter, I also, at the end of each of those stints, came out from behind the counter and interviewed a lot of people. Because I could see a lot by working right up close with them, kind of the kinds of things that you were talking about, Rabbi, um, how they were transacting, what they were using their money for. Uh, but then I, want, I got a chance to actually ask them questions and say, do you have a bank account? Why are you coming here instead of the bank? Um, and the three things that really jumped out at me as the reasons why people were choosing to use the check casher were, surprisingly, cost and liquidity, transparency, and service. So when you hear about what's wrong- I'm sorry, these are all the things that bags, banks brag about exactly. and claim superiority on. Exactly, right? right? Yeah. So, um, so it was especially the cost piece, right? Everyone will say, why are you spending so much money to cash a check and to use those services uh, if you could get them for free at the bank? Well, guess what? First of all, they're not for free, not free. And if you looked at the data, when I speak with a, you know, with a PowerPoint, I have a bunch of charts that just show these lines going up like this, which are, represent ATM fees, minimum monthly balances, um, uh, how much you would charge, if you get charged for an overdraft, all these kinds of things have gone up exponentially since the 80s, since the era, era of uh, deregulation. 
Um, so people realize that. A lot of people told me, I'd love to have a bank account, but I can't afford one. Uh, because they, uh, they can't afford to keep the enough money in it to make the cost truly free. Related to that is liquidity. So a lot of people told me, um, I can't afford to wait for my check to cash uh, to get access to my money. If I put my check in on a Friday, it's not going to be available to me till Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. And during that time, I might be paying late fees because I can't get my bills paid on time. Right? Um, there's a guy who came in, I tell this story sometimes, who was a contractor. Uh, he, we had a lot of people who were small business people who did odd jobs or s painting or light construction. Um, he came in one day with a pretty large check. It was about $5,000, which was large for somebody like that. I, I cashed his check. It cost 1.95% of the face value of the check to cash it. He took his cash, slipped a $10 bill under the window, which was my tip. Um, and then left, and I turned to the teller who trained me, and I said, like, why is Tony spending that much money to cash his check? That's a big check. He's got to have a bank account. He's got a truck with his name on it, right? He's not just, a, like, a guy on the corner. And she was like, well, Lisa, it's Thursday, which means tomorrow's Friday. He's got to go around and pay his guys. We're all in New York City. We know that um, if you've ever had anybody do work on your house, there's a crew of people that may or may not be documented. They may or may not um, have a bank account. They need their money on Friday. Tony can't wait for that check to clear, or otherwise he won't be able to pay his guys. Or maybe he got a job doing some work at a local business or some other contract, and the only reason he got that contract was that he could start tomorrow. And he can't start tomorrow unless he can go to the lumber yard today and get all the supplies with the cash from the check that he needs to cash. So the point is that when you look at that particular reason of cost liquidity, people are doing those calculations and saying, it's worth it to me. The cost that I'm paying to get a hold of my money right now is worth it to me because I'm parlaying that into something I need. I'm keeping my business going. I'm, or in the case of somebody who's not in business for themselves, they're getting to put food on the table. It's easy, or they're paying their bills on time. So I saw a lot of people come in, they'd cash that check, they'd spread their bills out in front of them, and I could see, oh, there's a shutoff notice from Con Ed. There's um, you know, a potential late fee on their phone bill. And I could see them saying, like, all right, I can keep this pay this much to Con Ed to keep my lights on. I'm going to pay this much so that my phone stays on. And then whatever is left, and they're paying $1.50 to pay each of those bills. So you go, wow, they paid the 1.95%. Now they're paying $1.50 for each of those bills. Look at all the money they're paying when they could go to the bank. Guess what? The bills are paid on time. It's, uh, they know exactly what they've paid. They're not going to pay a late fee, and they're not going to overdraft. Overdrafts, uh, banks made what, $32 billion, something like that, right, in overdraft fees alone last year, 35 bucks a pop, right there, that one overdraft fee pays for all your check cashing services for the month, and most of those people have been burned doing that. So they're making a rational decision because they don't have a better option. Second, transparency, I'll be really quick. Um, if you've, how many people have ever walked into a check cashing store? So pretty good number, it's more, than, more than the average crowd. Um, but what you'll notice is that the signage is big and transparent. So you walk into those stores, you know exactly what everything costs. Walk into a bank, <laughs> ask for the disclosure <laughs> agreement for your checking account, which is 44 pages of fine print, in which it says that uh, you can't sue them in a class action suit or that you'll, you know, how often they'll be able to ding your account for an overdraft fee. It is not transparent. Um, so people get a lot of. Um, uh, calm from seeing that transparency, knowing what they're paying and feeling like they're not getting tricked. And finally, they get served a lot better. Um, in the places that I worked, I was trained to use a customer's name three times in every transaction to know what they were, where they worked and who their family were. The women who I worked with in the South Bronx had each been at that store for 10 years, so people in the community knew that they could come in. They could come in with a letter that they got about jury duty that was in English and have somebody say in Spanish what they should do about it. Um, so there was a lot more than just financial services going on. And what it showed me was that people were making rational decisions, even though to many of us in this room they might seem expensive. Uh, true or false, the average customer was getting a better deal from the check cashing institution than they would have been from Citibank. True. And in many cases, right, in many cases, they also, Citibank did, wouldn't, not, not only didn't want them, but didn't take them, right? So when the New York City ID was created several years ago, before it was even created, the police department called me and said, what do you think about this as 
something that could get, you know, help with financial inclusion. And I said, great, people don't have a good ID. Guess what, the four biggest banks don't take that as a valid form of ID, right? Go to Amalgamated, good bank, and they do, but, um, but the four biggest banks don't do it. So what does that tell you about what, how much they want this, this community? Yeah, I could, clearly it makes my blood boiling. Yeah. <laughs> Rabbi, how many of the people that you serve um, have had experience with uh, the al alternative? Uh, I'm sorry, Professor. What's the right term to use for? Uh, well, you I you use did alternative. Uh, alternative. Um, was, some of the okay. folks in the business like transactional right. because mm -hmm. they, that's what it's about. But I think alternative is the. More yeah. Important. How many people come in having had experiences with alternative uh, sorts of services? Uh, what What do they say about them and? How many questions do they ask before they're really convinced that you're not going to charge them 101% <laughs> interest? Yeah, um, I don't know really uh, how often people who borrow from us also use alternative financial services, but I assume that it's a lot for the reasons that uh, Lisa just went through. And um, I will say that there is a, there's a context here for all of this, right? The, um, the four banks that don't uh, you uh, honor the uh, IDNYC are nationally chartered banks. Right? New York actually has a pretty good regulatory regime around financial services, but a lot of the financial services institutions are basically exempt from all of that because they're federally chartered um, or they're s banks chartered in other states and they're importing some services into New York and our laws in this country have preemption for, uh, for those out of state and federal uh, institutions. So you have banks that don't really meet the needs of lower income people and then the check cashers come in and, and online lenders and other kinds of alternative financial services and of course they should. Of course they should come in and fill up that space and, and, and people need it. But I just wanna also say that there, thank God, there, there is regulation around check cashers in New York because I was just at a panel that Lisa was on with Joe, the guy who owns the check casting chain, <laughs> and he flat out admitted, A, that he would, if he could, charge a lot more, but he can't because of the state regulations, and he sees the one federal regulator that is charged with sticking up for the ordinary person using financial services, that is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, as- Of blessed uh, memory. Well, you know, <laughs> That's, we can talk about that too, but, but Joe said he felt like that organization is an abomination before God. I think that's a direct that, quote. That was a direct quote. <laughs> Assemblywoman, um, <laughs> regulation, legislation, what is the proper role and, um, and, 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 and was, your, um, was your particular assembly uh, acting in its proper role before you got there to fix it? So first of all, let me say that my f experience with check cashing go back to probably when I was seven. My mother, as I said, was a home attendant. And her checks weren't really big. And I remember Saturday mornings, our routine was ballet, the check cashers, pizza, and then go pay bills. And my mom was a regular at the check cashing place, which actually is still in Inwood. Um, and it was for those same reasons. It was for the reasons that if she did not cash that check, the late, the, you know, that she wouldn't be able to make the payments on the rent, on the light bill, being pretty much the only breadwinner in the house, that was the option she sought. Something else I want to point to, in my community, in Upper Manhattan, there really weren't that many banks when you look back in the 90s, right? So I vividly remember there was a Banco Popular, there was Apple Bank, and there was Chase, I think, maybe. There was some bank in the corner where Chase is now. Now that our community has changed, there's a Bank of America, there's a TD Bank, there is um, a Citibank, there is a ton of banks. That wasn't necessarily the case 20, 30 years ago. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, in communities where people are aging, habits are really, really hard to break. Um, and when a person is so used to going in to this check cashing place, and has a relationship with a check casher, even if they have regular bank accounts, they will still go into the check cashing place because there's sort of a consumer loyalty that is built in these places. Mm -hmm. um, and so as far as regulation, um, as the rabbi mentioned, New York State has one of the toughest laws um, regulating these institutions. There was a very heated debate this past session 
around the Financial Services Modernization Act of 2017, which was basically the check cashing industry was asking for a change in not only the name, they wanted to rename the industry from check cashing to sort of financial service centers, but also to lift the cap on the amount of money that people could, could cash um, at a check cashing place. There was another bill that sort of allowed them to do conduit services where they would be able to do other types of services at their check cashing place. There was a big discussion around a master um, lease agreement where they would be able to simultaneously open up more check cashing places with one license. And there was a very heated debate that happened in Albany, um, which ended up playing out in sort of communities, arguing and, and really having a very frank discussion about what banking looks like in a lot of underserved parts of our state. Um, there was a lot of conversations around wealth building in underserved communities, which I thought was very interesting because we often don't talk about wealth when we're talking about poor people and building wealth and how to educate people. Um, there was a lot of strong, strong feelings, as you said, a lot of assumptions about what check cashers do and if they should be called financial service centers because they would give off this legitimacy that people were not comfortable with. And then there was a group of people, a lot of people from the Bronx also, who felt that check cashers were being penalized for being loyal in their communities and sticking it through the tough times. So we had a lot of discussions around the legislation. Um, a lot of the discussion happened in the assembly. The Senate is in Republican hands, and so there wasn't as lively of a debate there. But in the assembly, it really opened up a conversation about wealth building in communities of color, which I thought was very interesting. And it got a lot of us um, involved in sort of what are the solutions that we can come up with. Um, we talked a lot about credit unions and how credit unions can be part of that solution. Um, we talked a lot about um, pawn shops, which I learned a lot about. And people tend to link cashiers or check cashing places and um, pawn shops. The industry does not like that. The industry does not want that linkage to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and we talked a lot about payday loans and, and what the intention was for the check cashing industry, what, what they really wanted to see happen. Ultimately, they didn't get the bill. It didn't happen. Um, they didn't get what they wanted. There was The bill was sort of separated into two different bills. Um, the conduit bill didn't pass, and neither did the modernization bill. But there was more positive conversation around sort of uh, the raising the cap issue. There was some positive conversation, even though there was a lot of worry about you know someone walking in with a $15,000 check, a $20,000 check, and walking out sort of in the middle of the South Bronx or in the middle of Harlem, in the middle of Upper Manhattan, with that amount of money in their pocket and what that would mean for the safety of the community. So you know, ultimately, the bills didn't pass. They lived to see another session. Mm -hmm. Should be interesting to have these conversations again. But I think what was sparked and, and what was the most interesting part was that each of us brought that perspective of our own communities. And we had this very frank conversations about poverty and how to solve sort of the financial needs of our communities um, in a collective way because we represent the entire state of New York. The issues that we have in New York City are not the issues of the North Country, mm -hmm. right? And how do you legislate for a state that is so different um, throughout, so. Will you tell us more about the, the contours of the conversation around wealth building? Sure. Um, what, what was being discussed and, and who was deemed you know, um, responsible for uh, initiating more efforts so that more wealth building could happen? Yeah, well, one of the things that brought, was brought up that I thought was interesting was sort of um, t having sort of a road show to go out to sort of South Brooklyn and, and other parts of, of the state and the city, really, that are traditionally underrepresented communities, underbanked communities, and talk about, you know, people who have lived there that have already generated some wealth. They talked a lot about gentrification within this conversation, right? Like, what's happening in Brooklyn now? with the disparities in, in income, and how living in communities that were traditionally viewed as really, really low income have changed, and how do we have that conversation? So there's this idea about sort of forming a subcommittee of sorts um, where we would 
go to different communities and start having these conversations about community banking and about what uh, what are sort of the experiences of check cashing industry, the pawn <laughs> industry, and also other um, consumer protections that we can work on in our state. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned credit unions. And I've always wondered why there aren't more of them, and uh, especially in New York City. Mm -hmm. And is it a sort of regulatory red tape problem, one that you might have a role in solving, or, or is it not something you've looked at in great detail? I haven't looked at it in very great detail, but I also wondered the same thing. Um, one discussion that happened while we were talking about credit unions was this discussion about um, Bitcoin and other types of currency. Um, and the reasoning behind why credit unions weren't coming to our communities, like for example, in my section of, of Manhattan, we have credit where credit is due, the Manhattan Trust, right? The Neighborhood Trust, which has been there for a really long time. It's a trusted institution. People love it. But that's really the only option there as far as credit unions are concerned. And we're not sure why that happens, right? So that's something that we're definitely going to be looking at. Why? more credit unions are in opening, because if that is a solution, why aren't they coming? Right. Brad, uh, I actually have a, a little bit to say about that. Mm -hmm. uh, again, there is legislation that was passed in Albany a while back to create a community development financial institution fund. And so the fund is there. Just nobody's putting any money into it. <laughs> so I think one thing that might be inhibiting the formation of more credit unions is that there needs to be some uh, assistance with capitalization of those institutions. And w we could do it if we wanted to as, mm -hmm. a, as a state, um, but it would have to be a decision to do something towards making these sorts of institutions more prominent. And if the banks aren't going to step in, I, I do want to say one more thing about banks, though. Um, you know, banks get a huge lift from the American taxpayer. Right? Banks can't actually do their business if they can't borrow from the Fed. <laughs> um, banks can't do their business, well, I guess they can do their business, but they'd be much less likely to do their business if they didn't have FDIC insurance. There are lots and lots of ways in which all of us subsidize the banking industry. And so it is, it seems only fair <laughs> that the banking industry should serve more people in this country. And these are public policy choices. And this is actually the point I wanted to get around to, which is that People uh, in religious communities, people of faith, one of the things that they can contribute to the whole public debate about access to basic financial services is, what does this say about us? Mm -hmm. Who are we as a society when we make choices uh, about law and public policy? Those choices reflect who we are. Um, they not only express our values, they also shape our values. And we grow up with a certain you know, this is just the way of the world. You grow up with a check cash or anything, that's just the normal way to do things and that's what we have to pay. But there are alternatives mm -hmm. and um, people who are paying attention to these things include consumer advocates, but they also include increasingly uh, faith communities and I think that that's a very good thing. Well, let's go there. So what stake and what say do religious communities actually have here? Is there a way to frame this conversation theologically? Let's start with the word credit. Mm -hmm. right, word credit is related to the word credo in Latin, which means belief. Everything in the economy runs on trust and belief. You can't have an economy if people won't inter, uh, if they, people won't transact with each other, and if everything has to be checked and contracted for, then everything slows down and it's massively inefficient. So, I think that it is of great interest to faith communities, um, the level of social trust and our ability to believe in, uh, in, in, in institutions and in, in each other, uh, if there is such a dysfunctional relationship between the financial services industry and so many people who are trying to access it, you know, I think it really does damage the kind of trust and belief that religious institutions spend a huge amount of time trying to instill in people. We are one of the deepest wellsprings of faith and trust in this country. And when that, you know, is, is in some ways um, not reciprocated or in some ways destroyed, 
by the actions of the institutions that are supposed to be helping us thrive and, and, and advance in our lives, then I think that that is not just a economic problem, not just a social justice problem, but that is a problem for who we are as a faith community in this country. Mm -hmm. so, word about sure. that? I, I think this is also, I mean, this uh, notion of faith-based communities perhaps coming together uh, is also points to a really important moment for co coalition building around this, this issue. Um, one of the things that surprised me the most uh, in doing my research, when I started doing the research in the South Bronx, I thought I was gonna be painting a picture of um, how money moved and how people managed their money in a small, low-income neighborhood. Um, what I quickly realized was that um, there was a lot of wealth building. I uncovered lots of people who were using informal means of, say, right, like roscas, tandas, sociedades, where people were, um, susus, saving money collectively, um, get lending money to each other without interest, mm -hmm. and using that to build homes in their home countries, to save for college tuitions, all kinds of ways of building wealth. So there's that kind of breaking of the stereotype. Then when I went and worked at the payday lender, it was not mostly low-income people who were taking out those loans. It was a lot of people who are middle class, and you know, if you read the news, you realize that there are more than 50% of Americans can't come up with $400 uh, in the event of an emergency. More than half of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. The fastest growing group of payday borrowers right now are people who own their own homes, who have a college education, who make 50 or $60,000 a year. Those are not, those are our neighbors. Those are not poor people necessarily or people who live far away from us. We probably, I bet everybody in this room knows someone who's taken out a payday loan online. Um, you just don't know it because we're also, uh, our culture makes us embarrassed by the fact that we can't get by on our own. We're supposed to make it on our, uh, ourselves. And so we don't really have a conversation about this that feels like people can share the, the pain that we're in. But we're, there are more and more people who are living financially precarious lives. And I know for those of you who are in the, here in the afternoon, you heard Rachel Schneider talk about income volatility. So between the fact that we've had declining wages since the 1970s, that income volatility has doubled over the last 30 years, and that jobs are no longer paying for retirement and medical benefits, um, there too is this opportunity for coalition building among um, kind of strange bedfellows, right? Because there are more and more people. It's not just your constituents. Mm -hmm. it's, it's throughout the country. Reverend, did you want to weigh in here with the theological perspective? I just wanted to add for those who, who weren't with us this afternoon that the panel that we had on lending institutions across faith traditions um, that reflected um, both you know the Hebrew Free Loan Society and the um, education that you were all giving to um, the council people organizations in um, in Queens, which is a largely Pakistani but Uzbeki you know situation that reflected in some ways what you were saying with the um, Jewish community, you know, many about a hundred years ago, and and then also the Episcopal tradition, which was trying to draw on the the vast class and wealth diversity within our own tradition to establish a credit union that would both be a place where you know rich Episcopalians could feel good and deposit a lot of you know money towards the the capital, and also help people who were in a less wealthy situation um, have a, an access to capital. So it did was a perfect, I think, example of um, a kind of interesting coalition building in an area that probably people don't know a lot about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we're just a couple of minutes away from questions and answers. And before we get there, uh, a bit about process. Yes, um, we welcome your questions. And when you came in, or you'll have the opportunity now if you didn't get one when you come in, we've been handing out index cards and little pencils so that you have the opportunity to write down your questions. Um, Cornelia Dalton, our programming director, and I will be collecting them. If you pass, once you write your question, pass it to the outer aisles, and then we will collect them. I will sort through them and give them to Ron, and Ron will pose them to the panelists so over the next few minutes, after this next round of questions, we will then collect your questions and have the opportunity to expand the conversation to the audience as well. Thank you. Um, so Rabbi, in our 
pre-call, we, we talked about or you lamented the fact that um, so many of our choices about um, financial services and um, the services in particular that we provide or that are available to, to low-income people um, have just been sort of uh, almost utterly and completely outsourced to the market, all right? Um, and, you know, you exist in your day-to-day -day life to um, provide a particular non-market service. How much, m m how many more roles are there for other non-market services? Um, Professor, I know you, you've studied a fair number of them. You have familiarity with the Center for Financial Innovation, which has helped um, spawn some of those. Um, maybe you could talk about that. Sure. Well, I do think that there are, there are a lot of market alternatives that are coming online because there's a, you know there's availability of a lot of technology now a lot of us are doing finan our financial work on our phones or on our computers um, I, I agree with with David that all Americans all people deserve the right to safe affordable financial services right having access to financial services allows you to participate fully in the economy and in civil society so it is it's a moral and ethical thing I think too um, and that's it's simply not the level the playing field simply isn't level um, so we do have actors like the Hebrew free loan fund we have credit unions which are um, not for profit institutions and yet um, they aren't at a scale where most people can take advantage of them um, so the obvious question really then is why isn't the public sector stepping in to do that we've had conversations about it people talk about public banking, postal banking, um, none of those seem that pragmatic, particularly at this moment in time when the CFPB is being crushed into the ground itself um, and banks are getting even more of a benefit um, from, from public policy. Um, that said, I think that there are people who are mostly outside of the alternative financial services industry and outside of, um, of the banking industry who are innovating and thinking about how they can solve some of these problems. One of them is a company I like called Ripple in, in San Francisco that's not a service provider, but it works in the industry to allow value to be transferred immediately and without cost from one entity to another. So in other words, the founder, Chris Larson, calls it, talks about it as kind of an internet of value. So that when you have that check, your mom has that check and she needs to feed her children, um, that can happen immediately and without cost, as opposed to when I'm trying to send money to my relatives in Guatemala and I go to the Western Union or the check casher and it stops five times between when I give it to the check casher and when it gets to my uncle. And every time it stops, somebody takes a little money and there's, there's you know, room for error. So some of that innovation that's abetted by technology, I think can help some of these problems. Um, similar, thinking about the paraprofessional that you were talking about who came into your office, there's a firm called Even um, it's a, that works with banks, actually, but spreads pe when people have spikes and dips in their income, it allows them to spread that out over a year. Now, this person that came in for you was saying, like, well, it doesn't really matter because my 12-month income is not enough anyway. But there are lots of people who make $2,000 one month and 500 the next, and they need something to help them do that. So I think there's a lot of innovation that can help people. Um, there's a regulation issue with those too because um, a lot of the times there are people who are doing things on the cutting edge and um, regulators say like, we don't really get that. That sounds like it might be dangerous. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. And so innovation gets blocked sometimes and we need to think about that. I know the CFPB was thinking long and hard about that um, until a couple of weeks ago. So, um, so I think there's a lot of innovation and promise, but this whole notion of Providing safe, affordable financial services for everyone is a is a is a big nut, and I do think having as many or already organized communities advocating for that is really important. Sure, uh, Assemblywoman, what is the the product or market or service or business that you would most like to see in your district that does not yet exist that could help do some of the things that we've talked about? Well, one of the things that I think gets left out of the conversation a lot is our small businesses. So I oftentimes get a desperate call from a small business who's been in the community for however long and he's like, I have to shut my doors. And um, I'm like, what's going on? And either you know, we know the real estate values in Manhattan and we know that a landlord can say, well, your rent is $10,000, well, now it's 50. Thank you very much. Um, but there's also a lot of pressure with sort of as um, the internet and, and, and the 
a sort of electronic means for people to do their work or their buying or their shopping or everything else um, that is really putting pressure on these small businesses. Um, I went into a, a travel agency the other day, and it's a travel agency that's been around for, oof, I think I was in high school the first time I set foot in, in that travel agency. And um, the gentleman said, you know, I'm going to close my doors. I said, what's going on? He said, well, in order to keep my license as a travel agent, I have to have $70,000 in the bank that I can't touch. I go into a bank because I want to renovate. I've had this place open for years, mm -hmm. and I can't get a loan because I have to have that $70,000 without touching it. Besides that, I really can't have any capital that's accrued from my business in order to say, hey, I can pay this loan back. But I've never owed a day of rent as I've you know, been in this business ever. But banks are not taking that sort of faith, mm -hmm. that leap of faith on some of these small businesses. And so they're finding their, themselves in a position where they have to get innovative about how they're going to get that money. Mm -hmm. Whether they're going to go to someone and say, you know, just front me the money and I'm going to pay you back at exorbitant rates that are not regulated, that are, you know, in the shadows, if you will. Um, and I think we're not doing enough sort of to look at the issue in, through the lens of the small businesses. Mm -hmm. um, my community has a vacancy rate that is ridiculous. And stores will open up, they will be beautiful, and they will close in two months. And so that's something that I really want to see us address better, understanding the market pressures and understanding the real estate issues and how that runs in New York City. Um, it's definitely something that I, I would love to see addressed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Rabbi, do you do any loans to businesses? We do a lot of loans to businesses, and we'd like to do more loans to businesses. Um, we're, if your travel agent hasn't figured it out yet, please send them over to us. Um, we do about $2 million of small business loans. They average between twenty five and $50,000. Um, and one of the main ways that people are building wealth in communities and not just income is by becoming business owners and, and not just working for a salary. So I feel like um, in addition to making safe, affordable credit available, we do it in a lot of ways that help people in, in communities build wealth. They go to college. Basically, the difference in America between having a college degree and not having a college degree is the difference between your likelihood of living below the poverty line, your likelihood of living above the poverty line. So if you can get yourself to college somehow and, and graduate, then that is a very significant economic benefit alongside of the educational benefit that you got. Um, home ownership. Uh, there's a program in New York City called Mitchell Lama, which enables people to buy an apartment for you know $70,000. Uh, now they can only sell it for $72,000 uh, at the end. But uh, it's intended to keep a stock of affordable housing available. Well, if you're low income and you get to the top of the very, very long Mitchell Lama list, uh, you need to come up with $70,000 within, like, I think the space of a month and a half or two months. So we'll do those loans. And then people have their housing, you know, set. And uh, those kinds of things, small businesses, education, housing, those are how people wind up building wealth. And there mm. needs to be more opportunities for for people to achieve that, we you talked about scale. Um, you know, we we're doing 1,100 loans a year. That's not <laughs> that's the drop in the bucket um, compared to the need. Mm -hmm. But the question is, could nonprofit uh, a nonprofit no interest and low interest lenders scale? I think it's a really interesting question, and I would like to test out <laughs> the that that question. And and I know that the Hebrew Free Loan Society could easily do two, three, or four times the amount of lending that we're doing if we had the capitalization and, and the other resources to support it. So there's, there's a lot of growth potential in some of these sectors that are trying to specifically target the needs of lower income borrowers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I have a stack of excellent questions here, and um, we're going to try and answer every single one of them. Um, to what extent might new mobile phone payment services like Venmo um, provide a competitive alternative to check cashing services? So I guess there's some question as to whether 
that's necessary, if more people than we might think at first glance are, are satisfied with the services that exist. But it, you know, it's also the case that in other parts of the world, um, uh, almost the entire financial system has moved over to mobile phones. I mean, Kenya probably being the most prominent um, example of that. Um, so, uh, Professor, what do we know about um, mobile technology and, um, and its potential here? Most mobile technology, things like Venmo, they have a, back on the ba a bank on the back end. So they're not um, substitutes for banks, they're kind of an add-on to banks, um, and they make banks money. I, I think one of the things that's puzzling but true about financial services and behavior in our society is that it's not as easy to change as one would think it would be. I mean, everybody's trying to rep, th thinking about why can't you make in peso, which is the Kenyan um, product for the most part. Why doesn't that work everywhere? And it's a complex story about context. Uh, we use more checks in this country by far exponentially than any other country in the world. So why is that? Why do we write so many checks? Um, and why are people resistant to that, to changing that behavior? So that's a piece of it as well. And I think um, even though we do that, it is declining. I think some of these businesses, the check hashing business, for one, is um, it's a business model that'll be a dinosaur at some point. You talked about kind of older people being more resistant to change. You know, lots of people still like to get their social security check at the check casher and cash it right there. But I do think um, uh, with the millennial population kind of moving up through the kind of age trajectory, that we are seeing a lot more people doing their business and managing their finances on their phones, but it's not necessarily solving this problem of making financial services safer safe and affordable and accessible to all Americans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thing that still sort of boggles my mind um, is, is that uh, in, in the United States, in, in, in many respects, we're still very much a, a developing country in this regard. The fact that you cannot use your, mu your phone to, uh, it, it is starting to change, but it, it's still extremely difficult to use your phone to instantly push money from your bank account to somebody else's in three or four easy steps and have, have it happen right away. The fact that that is still so hard to do, it, it just blows my mind. And it's for all of the reasons you describe, right? So it's like if we, if we can't give an instant loan on our own to someone that we know, uh, you know, how, how, how can we expect uh, a startup to do it for us? It's, it's, it's frustrating. Um, what roles uh, are there for um, traditional private sector companies? Um, I have a, let's say, I have a life insurer, someone else that, that wants to do good in this regard. Are there particular examples that any of the three of you that can think of about you know sort of existing large firms um, that are doing good work um, for people and in in populations or communities where you might not expect to see them? One thing I can think of right away is lending, right? So we didn't really talk, we, I, I tend to, and many of us maybe conflated a little bit, check cashing and payday lending, and there's no payday lending in New York, but um, we've seen a retraction of credit since the financial crisis. It's much harder to get a small amount of credit, meaning up to two, three, five thousand dollars um, and when you do, it costs you a lot of money, either whether it's from a credit card or certainly if, a, if you're getting a payday loan. Um, what some firms are doing is uh, are they are enabling lending through the firm, right? So, so and there are middle middleman kind of companies that will work with the firm to set up a loan fund. So you're basically getting a, a payday loan through your company, but it doesn't cost anything. And one of the things we do know is that credit scores, which have become much more important as part of your financial indemnity for getting a job, for getting an apartment, um, for getting credit and low cost credit. Um, the way that those are measured are not perfect in terms of measuring the credit worthiness, particularly of immigrants, of people who are just emerging consumers, like they just graduated from college. Lots of reasons why people might have a bad credit score but are very credit worthy. And so if you work for a firm and they can see that you've worked there for five years and you get this paycheck every two weeks, um, it's a pretty low risk loan for them to lend you that money in advance of your paycheck and get it back. So I think that's a place where, first of all, it's a third kind of company. It's not the insurance company, but it's a business that's coming in and doing this, or the company can do it themselves. So bi especially big corporations can play a large role in helping the financial health of their employees. Um, also things like nudging people to um, put money automatically into their pay, pay uh, into their pensions. But I've even seen this kind of employer-based lending. There's a 
a bake, if any of you have spent time in the Bay Area, you've probably had Acme Bread. It's a great local bakery. They do it for their bakers and their employees, um, just without having a, a middle person, and it works beautifully, and nobody there ever takes out a payday loan. So, one example. Mm -hmm. I won't talk about um, for-profit firms because I think you covered that very well, but I will say that uh, nonprofits can actually do some things. Hmm. Uh, a lot of nonprofits, larger ones in particular, have um, very large endowments. And there's a way that they can use their balance sheets to uh, help uh, institutions that are trying to make uh, financial services available to lower income people. So we're doing this at the Hebrew Free Loan Society. Um, we uh, are a... Uh, we're, we're an agency of the UJ Federation of New York, and um, we have some uh, of our money in their investment pool. And I don't want to describe the whole complicated uh, arrangement, but essentially what we've asked them to do is um, help us collateralize a loan, um, and they've done it with, uh, with, with the bank that they deal with um, with their billion dollar endowment. So the bank said, yes, of course, we'll help you. Yeah. And if we had gone there, uh, we might not have gotten the same treatment. And it just made a financial transaction much, much easier for a group like ours. And so there are a lot of ways that foundations that are sitting on very you know, large endowments, um, they don't necessarily have to give out more money, but they're starting to do more investing. They're starting to do more lending. And they're using their balance sheet instead of uh, their grant making or alongside of their grant making to increase the impact and that's a way that some of these community development financial institutions can get capitalized. Um, can a church or a mosque start a credit union? How? I can't remember the rules on religious institutions specifically. Do you know Assemblywoman or does anyone? Yeah. Has it been done? Does anyone know? A lot of church-based credit unions. Mm -hmm. Happens a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a lot of credit unions that still exist in church basements. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, where that's where they're run. But uh, are they grandfathered vis a vis all of the capital requirements that make the hurdle so high now? I mean, are these churches don't have seven million dollars, or you know, a seven figure amount of money sitting sitting around. Five hundred thousand. Yeah, and some number of years to get it started. I, I did look into it a number of years ago because it made no sense to me that um, a, a community as progressive as, a, as Park, Clo Park Slope, where I live, was being serviced entirely by Chase and City. It just it was a total disconnect, and I was going to try and get the Park Slope Food Co-op to start a credit union. Um, you know, which, right, uh, any of you know the co-op know that's sort of like beating your head against a brick wall. Um, but, the, but the regulatory requirements were such that it, it was just clear it was going to be years of pain and suffering besides whatever would go on with the co-op's board. Um, and uh, it just seemed um, daunting. But um, whoever it is um, that asked, if you actually go down that road, um, it's a story that I've actually always wanted to write for, for literally more than 15 years. I've been on my kind of ongoing list of stories that I haven't done yet is the sort of beginning to end story of somebody who starts a credit union from scratch. So I, I'd, I'd love to hear that story. I'd love to write that story uh, if you actually do it someday. Ah, so this was a question I was going to ask the panelists. Um, I'm, I'm glad someone suggested it. What, what can we do as individuals to, to, to go out and, and help change the, the, the banking industry's lack of transparency um, for low-income families in particular? Or uh, to skin it a different way, what, what, are the consumer, what are the consumer choices that we can make, as, aside from our lobbying or political activity, um, that help make sure that we're doing the right thing with our own money. Move your money. Mm -hmm. If you bank, uh, the four largest banks hold ha more than half of all deposits in the United States right now. Mm -hmm. um, you may think that you need an ATM on every corner. You may think that there's um, a lack of convenience at others, but many more credit unions and um, smaller community mm -hmm. banks are now reimbursing people. For, like if you have to go to an out-of-network ATM, mm -hmm. they'll pay mm -hmm. you back. 
Um, they're, they're, and the, only, the other thing besides the fact that these banks are making money on the backs of the poor, I would say, at least as much as check cashers and payday lenders. In fact, they also benefit. When, you, when the payday lender, you can't pay that loan and they try to get it out of your account, they're getting an overdraft fee. So they love payday lending because they're making a lot of money off of it too. Um, as an aside. Um, however, uh, so look for banks in your community. There's a website called banklocal.info. There's another organization um, called the Global Alliance for Banking on Values. So you can often, you'll certainly save money if you go to a credit union. On average, people spend much less on banking fees per year if they bank at a credit union than at a mainstream bank. Um, the other thing is that uh, we don't, we're just starting to realize that banks are doing a lot of things with our money while we sleep that we don't realize. They're investing in prisons, they're investing in fossil fuels, they're engaged in land grabs in developing countries, they're supporting politicians that you might not choose to give your money to, but you essentially are if you're leaving your money with them. So you need to do that kind of research. Um, Look for local banks, look for community banks. One that I love in New York City is Amalgamated Bank, which started as a union bank um, and does great work if you look at, if you look at their website. Um, so I think moving your money is one of the most powerful things that you can do as an individual. And if you're putting it in a good bank like that, there's also a much higher chance that that bank is investing in small businesses, the kind that are breaking down in the assemblywoman's community than if you go to a large bank. Part of the reason that that travel agent can't get a loan is that the big banks have pulled way back on, bus on small business lending in their communities and the local banks are doing it. I think one of the things that um, has worked a little bit for me and some of the people that I know, I deal with a lot of people that, for example, English is not their primary language or they have a lot of access issues. So one of the things that I tell them is to go into different banks and ask questions. Right, you kind of get a sense when you go into a bank, sort of the type of institution that it is, just by how you're greeted at the door, um, how you're perceived if you're someone of a different race or you speak a different language. Um, so I always tell people, just kind of shop around. You don't have to make any commitments. Go in, figure it out. See if they're offering you financial literacy help or any finan other financial services other than trying to get you to open a checking account or a, or a savings account. Um, and sort of keep your options open in that way. Agree with you, go to smaller banks. There's a lot of incentives now. For example, if you're in the public sector, when I worked at the city council, um, if you signed up for the municipal credit union, you get your check early, right? You get it on a Wednesday instead of a Friday. There's a tons of um, different benefits and incentives that exist um, for, for different workers in the city that will benefit you if you actually go to these smaller banks. I encourage people to go and visit the Neighborhood Trust in my community, um, go see if they have any ATMs available. One of the things that is happening in our communities that we're getting proliferation of these ATM storefronts. Um, and I always say to people, when you see an ATM storefront, run. They're trying to get you to overdraft. Um, and they're trying to get fees off of that. They don't even think we're worth it enough to have someone there to answer your questions. Look the other way and find someone that actually takes the time to answer your questions. So I, I would say number one thing that makes it really hard for lower income people to pay so much for basic financial services is that they don't have enough money. And so you know, number one thing we can do is advocate for a better jobs that pay a here, decent here. wage. And also uh, programs that incentivize saving and wealth building. So if people had more to, to deal with, it would not be so hard for them to make it from paycheck to paycheck. They wouldn't have to spend so much of their money. There is a, um, a great book called How the Other Half Banks. And the opening line in that book is that um, lower income families spend as much money on financial services as they spend on food annually. So that is kind of shocking. Um, you can also, um, I don't think that financial literacy is the solution to the problem. As Lisa said, I mean, people are pretty savvy about the decisions that they're making. However, there are many very helpful financial counseling programs out there. And people who want to take advantage of these, and um, it can be very, very helpful. So I think you can support those. I think you can scale <laughs> nonprofit, no interest and low interest lenders, and um, I think you can promote the credit union movement, even if you don't 
bank at a credit union. You can still be supportive of the credit union movement. Um, you can prevent payday lenders from uh, getting a foothold here uh, in the state of New York. This is a constant fight. And um, the usury cap in the state of New York, happy birthday, it's 300 years old in oh. 2017. It was passed in 1717, before New York was a state, and um, it's, been, uh, it's been in force ever since. The rate has changed, it used to be 5%, now it's 25%, but New Yorkers feel very strongly that above a certain rate, it's just, it's just robbery. And there's a, there's a great verse in the book of Proverbs, lo tigzal dal ki dalhu. Don't rob the poor just because they're poor. It sounds like common sense, but it happens all the time. And also, you know, shows us that things we're talking about here on the Upper West Side in the 21st century were also big issues for people back in Bible times. Financial instability leads to vulnerability, and that opens the door to people um, being taken advantage of. And we, collectively, through um, our religious communities, through our citizenship, we need to really advocate for alternatives to methods of dealing with a broken system that wind up costing uh, a lot of money for the people who can least afford it. So, uh, uh, hey, wait a minute question. Um, uh, don't commercial banks have a, have a commitment to do a whole ton of community-based lending? Is, is that real or is it a sham or is it just not enough? There was a law called the Community Reinvestment Act. It was passed in 1977. It uh, didn't have real teeth, which means it wasn't really enforced until 1992 when President Clinton amended it. Even then, it's, it's, it's been pretty weak. Um, it mandated that banks lend in the neighborhoods that they are you know, allowed to serve. Um, but banks can get out of their community reinvestment uh, CRA uh, um, requirements pretty easily. They do some financial literacy in the neighborhoods. They have uh, a few programs. And so, and, and at this point, banking has changed enough where at that point it was very much about location and having branches and locations. And now banking's changed enough that the let most people agree that that regulation should be updated and modernized. So the answer is like, yes, sort of technically, but nobody really holds their feet to the fire. There, in fact, is no provision in the CRA for evaluating the effectiveness of the CRA. So Congress asked the Congressional Research Service to try to figure out, does the CRA actually make a difference? And the answer of the Congressional Research Service was, we can't figure it out. <laughs> we don't know whether banks would be doing this sort of lending anyway for, for business reasons. It's really hard to tell. So it isn't the case that there's currently, you know, sort of a, a tough set of regulations requiring uh, banks to to do lending in underserved areas. Okay, um, last question. Uh, can you name any banks uh, where people with a low amount of resources can open an account with low fees? Assemblywoman, you told us what sort of institutions to avoid. Are you allowed to make endorsements or would that get you in all sorts of trouble with your no, constituents? I can, I can talk about donors. sort of, <laughs> you know, again, my experiences, right? Like I've had an account on Apple Bank, it's a pretty good bank. I, I tend to like the smaller banks, the older banks. Um, there is also, as I said, the credit union on 165th Street, I'm a big fan. Um, I do want to say though, something that happens in my community often, we, would we will have a bank like TD Bank, right? They'll be there and they're very nice. They'll do a few grants in the community. They'll grant a few nonprofits. And that I think is the extent, it's the responsibility that they feel to the co those communities that they're serving. Um, and that's just not enough. It's just way too little and it's just way too late. And I think that we need to continue to hold their feet to the fire when it comes to that because when they come to our community and they give $10,000 away and they think, oh, we helped. Goodbye. Um, as you said, no one's holding their feet to the fire. So we're looking at that in, in, in the banking committee. We're looking at what those effects have in our communities. And so to be continued, um, I hope to maybe do part two of this panel um, in, into next session and see what the banking committee comes up with in the state. But we're definitely looking at that. So. Professor, what's the easiest and quickest way to find an answer to that question if you're not sure 
uh, that you know even half of what's available within so five miles. So I would start miles. with the credit union, although mm -hmm. you're right, I did the same thing when I lived in Park Slope and said, where's the credit union can I, that I can join? I, it turns out I'm eligible for one um, because of, I was working at the new school, but I, it, there wasn't a branch nearby and it was gonna be hard for me to get my money out. Mm -hmm. um, but, so, but maybe that's not the case for you. So I would start by looking for a credit union um, and there is a database of credit unions in New York State that you can look at and you can see what the membership requirements are. Um, so I would, I would start there and then um, I would look at um, small community banks. Uh, one place that I like to look for comparison of financial services is a website called NerdWallet, mm -hmm. nerdwallet.com. And you can ask, you can kind of plug in a question like I'm looking for a low cost bank account and they will show you, they do a lot of rating um, in real time, kind of going over and showing you what the best credit card is. If you don't want a high balance, or you don't, you can't really secure it with much, or you have a low credit score. So I think they do a pretty good job. They probably do a less um, good job uh, if you really care about values and cost. But you want a, ba a black-owned bank? Go to bankblack.com. You want a women-owned bank? I mean, so think about what's most important to you and do that search. And if it's cost or community. Between credit unions and nerd wallet, you'll probably get a good answer. Excellent. Um, a round of applause for our panelists, please. I, I want to thank everyone. The uh, Louis Finkelstein Institute has been around since 1938, and its mission is to bring religious wisdom to issues of the day. I dare say, and I'll give New York Times money columnist. Ron Lieber, I'm going to use titles like you did, um, a great deal of credit and gratitude for having drawn out the issues in the effective way that you did. You know, you could have a career as a reporter, that this would work. Um, but I, I, I was almost laughing that you continually said professor, rabbi, assemblywoman. But the truth is, we got three incredibly different perspectives that added up to a rich conversation about the issue that we are all facing. So I particularly want to thank Assemblywoman Carmen De La Rosa, Rabbi David Rosen, and Professor Lisa Servan for this excellent panel. Thank you all and good night. Thank you.